So this video is going to be covering chapter 10, section 3, which is dealing with solids, in particular solids and their properties on a molecular level relating to the kinetic molecular theory. Now solids, as you may have guessed from the last two videos being about gases and liquids, going from um, erratic with gases being far spread out, going in random directions, to liquids where the molecules are all next to each other but they can sort of flow around one another. Solids are even more ordered than liquids, which again were more ordered than gases, and that solids are held together very strongly by intermolecular forces to the point that molecules cannot move past one another. However, this doesn't mean that they are locked in place. They still vibrate up and down, you know, left and right, into and out of uh, the page, etc. It's just that the intermolecular forces, that is, you know, the hydrogen bonds or hydrogen hydrogen bonds, the dipole dipole bonds, and the London dispersion forces have a much stronger influence over solids to the point where molecules are locked into place relative to the molecules next to them. There are two main types of solids that we're going to be discussing in this chapter. The first are what are known as uh, crystalline solids, and crystalline solids are much like the solids we have here, where the molecules are locked into a regular geometry relative to the ones around them. In this case, they're sort of locked into individual squares uh, relative to the ones around them. And there's also what are known as amorphous solids. Now, amorphous solids don't have a regular geometry like these, which form cubes or hexagons or what have you. Rather, they're sort of like liquids in that the molecules are sort of randomly distributed. However, they're still locked in place relative to one another. And now that I look at it, I actually sort of did form relative geometry. But amorphous solids uh, are irregular in their arrangement, but they're still locked in place just as the crystalline solids are. So now we're going to go into some of the properties of solids, starting off with one that is the property of definite shape and volume, which is a property that all solids have regardless of whether or not they are uh, crystalline or amorphous. However, crystalline solids always form what are known as a geometrically regular uh, shapes. This includes things like, uh, you know, cubes are geometrically regular or some crystals will, fo will form as hexagons, but they'll look more regular than that. Whereas the amorphous solids can form whatever shape they like. For example, glass, when you heat it up and melt it, you can form it into, you know, a beaker or a vase or any shape you like. And geometric solids, when you break them up, that is, if you were to smash this crystal, you would find it forms a bunch of tinier cubes. Likewise, this will form a bunch of fragments that are shaped like hexagons. Whereas if you were to shatter this glass beaker, you'd get all kinds of shards that have all kinds of weird shapes. Secondly, solids tend to have a regular volume, meaning that no matter how much pressure or temperature you put on them, the actual material will compress very little. And this is because if you look at a very simple representation of what a solid is at a molecular level, you can see that there's very little space here in between the, in between the actual molecules, which makes it very difficult to push them together or pull them apart due to the huge attractive forces between them. And this means that the solids will, for the most part, tend to maintain their shape, whether it's you know, beakers or plastics in the case of amorphous solids or maintain their crystalline shape in the case of crystals. A second property of solids is the definite melting point. Now this applies more to crystalline solids than it does to amorphous solids. And this is because crystalline solids, when you melt them, that is, when you add heat enough, the molecules eventually gain enough kinetic energy to break out from the bonds that are holding them together 
and begin to flow past one another, much like in a liquid. And this is why at a certain point, after you've added enough heat to get the metal to a specific temperature, above this threshold temperature, the molecules can then flow past one another by overcoming the intermolecular forces and become a liquid. Now while this melting point is an exact, an exact temperature rather for crystalline solids because each molecule for the most part is feeling the exact same attractive force relative to the ones next to it. In an amorphous solid where the molecules are sort of distributed randomly but still bonded together, uh, they can flow over a variety of temperatures. So it's not a certain threshold temperature that the substance gets to, and then once it gets above that, it's a liquid. Depending on the positions of the various molecules within the amorphous solid, what ends up happening is that some parts will begin to flow, that is, break free from the intermolecular forces, faster than other parts. And this is why amorphous solids, like glass, say, are sometimes called what are known as supercooled liquids. That is, they exert some properties of liquids, like random position, and once you add enough temperature, eventually flow in some parts. However, in most of, the, or at least for most of the time, the glass will tend to stay locked in position. The molecules will stay together, but Occasionally, a molecule will gain enough energy to flow past another one, which is why they're somewhat liquid, even in their solid states. Now we're going to talk about solids' uh, high density and their inability to be compressed. Now, as I've il illustrated already many times, solids, for the most part, tend to have their molecules packed together almost with the electron clouds uh, touching. And for this reason, they're very dense. You get a lot more mass in a block like this per, per unit volume, let's say this square, than you do in a gas where everything's you know spread out and you get three molecules per unit instead of you know 12. Uh, the close proximity of atoms within solids also makes them very incompressible because again there's not a whole lot of space in between the atoms so it's very hard to push these two together due to the uh, repulsion of their electron clouds. And this force is so great that solids are generally called incompressible. That is, they can't be pushed any closer together than they already are. Now, some substances like, say, cork feel, you know, squishy to the touch. It feels like you can compress them down. But that's really because within this cork there are tiny air bubbles and within these air bubbles the molecules are very spread out so when you push down on the cork what ends up happening is that these molecules will then push together to form a denser gas within it however the cork itself that is the solid part say right here isn't being compressed at all it's just the air bubbles that are changing their volume now the last property we're going to be discussing is the low rate of diffusion among solids and this one's kind of a no-brainer if you really think about it because if you take two solids and push them together, let's say this is zinc, and let's say over here we have copper. And now if we push them together, what you'll find is that very few, if any, atoms will diffuse from one side over to the other. And this is because, again, these atoms are bonded to their, you know, respective molecules next to them by huge intermolecular forces. And solids don't have the kinetic energy to overcome these intermolecular forces and leave their neighboring molecules, for the most part. There are exceptions, but the rate of diffusion among solids is millions of times slower than it is among liquids and gases. So now we're going to be going more in depth about the two types of solids beginning with crystalline solids 
and they can form one of a few different crystal structures. For example, uh, they can be isosymmetric, among others that I have listed over here on this chart. And what are interesting about crystalline solids is that you can take any one of these crystals, well obviously these are illustrations, but if you were to have an actual crystal that was say cubic, like this one right here, and you were to, you know, break it up, you would find that it's composed of smaller cubes. And then if you were to break that up, you would eventually get down to one cube that you could not break up into any further shape or any further crystals of the same shape. And this base crystal is what is known as a unit cell. And this is true for all the different crystal shapes. For example, you can get a hexagonal prism uh, unit cell that is the smallest possible hexagonal prism that you can form from this type of crystal. Just as precipitates and chemicals in solution can vary in their types of bonds, so too crystals can vary in the types of bonds. And we'll start off by describing the characteristics of ionic crystals. Now we've discussed ionic bonds before, and if you'll remember, ionic bonds tend to form a sort of lattice like we have illustrated here. And because of this reason, ionic bonds uh, tend to form crystals that are very hard and brittle with very high melting points. And this is because it's very hard to separate the actual unit atoms from one another when there's a strong positive and negative charge associated with the end of each molecule. Next we have what are known as covalent network crystals. And this category contains what is perhaps the most famous crystal, and that is diamond. Now diamond is written by the formula CX, where X would be the total number of carbon atoms within the diamond. However, it's very difficult to count each individual atom, so it's just given this formula for convenience. Now covalent network crystals, like diamond, are composed of atoms, each of which are covalently bonded to the ones next to them. And this means that electrons sort of flow around almost anywhere in the crystal that they want. Obviously it balances out evenly between the crystal because if you ended up with one end that was strongly negative or strongly positive, then the electrons would rush to this end or run away from that end. However, this uh, sort of flow of electrons and mutual covalent bonds between all the atoms within the crystal means it's very hard to separate individual atoms, which means that covalent network crystals, much like the ionic crystals, tend to be very hard. In fact, diamond is the hardest substance we know about. Metallic crystals, which are the next type of crystal we're going to be covering, are composed of metal nuclei surrounded by a sort of sea of electrons just sort of floating about around these nuclei attracted by their positive charge. However, because these electrons aren't associated with individual nuclei, they sort of belong to the crystal as a whole. So there's a bunch of, you can imagine, just a sea of free electrons. And this means that if you were to put a voltage dis uh, difference across this uh, metallic crystal, what would happen is these electrons would be able to flow very easily, forming a current. And this is why metallic crystals tend to be very good conductors. Finally, a covalent molecular uh, crystals are held together very limitedly by intermolecular forces, that is the London dispersion forces, or you know hydrogen-hydrogen bonds, or dipole-dipole bonds, etc. So because there's not you know a whole network of covalent bonds like there was in diamond, or strong positive and negative charge like there is in ions, it means that these covalent network or covalent molecular crystals
tend to be much weaker. That is, they can, they're soft, and they can be broken up a lot easier. They melt at very low points because their atoms or molecules aren't hard, held together super well, which means that it only takes a little bit of energy for one to slide past another, thus melting.